In this session, I get the um, joy and privilege to speak about one of the more sensitive topics in um, the church, and that is money. And specifically about how our finances, our money, our being stewards of money relates to also our spiritual responsibilities and faith, both faith and faithfulness. And uh, yet it's a topic that I love to speak on because I've had many experiences of God teaching me and working in this area of money. Now, some of the stories that I'll tell tonight have to do with kind of the big picture of money and some have to do with the really small um, little, little issues as well. So I hope you enjoy the stories as well, but we really especially want to look at what the Word of God says about money. So we'll start with the Lord's Prayer. If we think about that, it, we're talking about our Father who is in heaven, right? Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And I want to just pause there for a moment. Your kingdom come, that is heaven coming to earth, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And I think often we fail to realize that in praying that prayer, there is a recognition that God's will is not being done on earth as it is in heaven. So if our view is that God's will is always being done because God is sovereign, so everything that occurs is God's will, I think we have a wrong view according to the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples because we're supposed to pray that which means it's something that is often not happening. And when I ask myself, why is it often not happening? I think quite often Christians are the responsible ones. Actually, uh, Christians hold the vast majority of the world's wealth in their hands, those who name themselves as Christians. And so when there is an inequality, when there is injustice, when there are needs that are not being met, I think in some sense those who name themselves as Christian have some degree of responsibility for why God's will is not being done. Some years ago uh, as YWAM we particularly began to pray for the city of London and as especially some of the leaders and others were praying they felt that God showed them that part of of the stronghold over London was greed and unrighteous trade. Now at the time when they shared that with a few Christian businessmen, they said, oh no, no, I don't think you're right. In London, your word is your bond. You shake on it, can, can trust your word, it will be done. Well, that was quite a few years ago, as you can imagine. And not too long after that, there began to occur and come into the light scandals that were taking place in London. But as we continued to pray for the city, and we did all kinds of things, fasting and prayer and prayer marches, and I can remember praying through parts of London, going with guitars, and one night it was raining so much that I just thought, oh my goodness, Lord, is this worth anything? Our guitars are fill filling up with water. Are you going to do anything as a result of these prayer and praise. I just didn't know, but I felt like, well, let's keep on praying. It was the year before March for Jesus started, and March for Jesus eventually, initially was praying for London and getting Christians out on the streets on a day, um, but eventually it became something that hap was happening in many nations around the world, but this was before all, we knew all that. And we were praying, uh, going through London, and we set up outside the London um, Stock Exchange, and we're having a worship time there on the steps. Graham Kendrick was leading us. And I looked, and there was a, a girl who was playing the violin, and uh, she was very vivacious. She was kind of dancing around. She had on these brightly colored um, trousers. And I took a picture of her. And a year later, I met her. And as I was showing her pictures in my photo album, she said, that's me, that's me, what am I doing in there? And she became my wife. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
And so sometimes when we're praying for big issues, God does amazing things that we're not expecting at all. As we continued to pray for London and through March for Jesus and pray especially against greed and unrighteous trade, some years later I received a call and this call was to please come to a private clinic in London because there was a woman there who was interested in uh, speaking to me, uh, interested in giving her, her house away. So I went to this clinic. She was there dying of cancer. She had a few weeks to live. She had recently given her life to the Lord. And I wasn't quite sure. I'd been told a little bit about of the background. But she had actually been the first woman journalist on Wall Street. And she'd given her life to be an investigative journalist, been an agnostic almost all of her life. She was friends, had lived in Britain. Uh, many of her pieces were done on investigating corruption and, and crime in high places by very wealthy individuals. And so she was checking me out. There was her friend who had exposed the Olympic scandal at the time. And she said, if I gave you the house, what would you do with it? And I began to explain how we would use it as a place for people to have furlough if they were coming back off the mission field, perhaps as a place of prayer. And she said, I think that's what I want to do. I want to give it to you. Uh, I think, unfortunately, um, her lawyer at the time uh, said that YWAM was no longer interested in it, got her to kind of just say in her will that it would be given to charity. We actually, through a long, long story, do have the use of the house, but uh, we don't own it. And I'm wondering how many times the stranglehold of money, of greed, hinders what God intends to do for his kingdom, that his will is often not being done. When I was speaking to some Asian businessmen uh, in a, um, a school of missions, and there were 40 or 50 of them there, one of the businessmen came to me and he said, John, you must come home. You must stay with me. I need to talk to you about my business. I was like, well, really, I'm sure they've arranged another place for me to stay. He said, no, you, you must come. I said, well, you'll have to agree with my host that that's okay because I've just met you. I don't know. And uh, as I drove home with this Asian Christian businessman and stayed at his uh, large home, which was a large guest house as well, he said, well, I'll tell you what my business is. I said, okay. He said, it's a funny business. Said, well, what is it? He said, I own casinos. <laughs> and he had three of them in the city. He said, Maybe she's right, I'm not sure. <laughs> and so we began to go back and forth, um, what would Jesus have him to do with his casino business? And uh, he brought me to one of his casinos so that I could pray there with him. And uh, you might imagine what advice I gave him. Uh, and uh, he, on one day, was deciding, yes, I'm going to get out of the casino business, I'll go into something else. But on the next day, when they go to church and their business shoes on Monday and act under quite different principles. We too often have not integrated God's understanding of money and how we steward money and what it means to use money, money in a truly Christian, in a truly biblical perspective. As Jesus said, you can only serve
deal with prayer? Want to give me a quick guess? Come on. Well, about 500. About 500. How many have to deal with faith? It's a really important topic. Less than 500. <laughs> and how many verses in the Bible deal with money? says, in the Gospels, 288 verses deal with money. That's about 10%, about a tithe of the Gospels are dealing with money. And yet, I don't think that we teach that much about it. Jesus Christ said more about money than about any other subject. It out. Luke 16, 11. If therefore you have not been faithful with the use of worldly wealth, who will entrust the true riches to you? One more time. If therefore you have not been faithful in the use of worldly wealth, who will entrust the true riches to you? Okay, you can sit down. The verse before says, uh, he who is dishonest in little will be dishonest in much, and he who is faithful with little will also be faithful with much. So this is Jesus speaking, and he's talking about worldly wealth, what we have in terms of money and possessions and our wealth, that if we're not faithful with that, then who will entrust the true riches to us? What, what would true riches be? What is he referring to? He's obviously not referring to material wealth. He's referring to true riches. What's he talking about? He's talking about, yes, riches that would be godly, riches that would be of eternal lasting value. Remember Jesus also said, says, don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust corrupt, the thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. So true riches are eternal riches. True riches are gifts that come from God. And Jesus is saying there's a direct correlation between how you use worldly wealth, your faithfulness in the use of money and worldly wealth, and whether or not God will entrust more to you in terms of true eternal riches and values. So money is a very, very important topic because how we use money directly impacts what God entrusts to us. There are three verses there that I mentioned, Luke 16, 11, that we've just read. So how we handle our money and possessions impacts is our our release of the use of true riches. The next verse is Matthew 25, verse 21. Matthew 25, verse 21. Just read that here. Um, of course, Matthew was a tax collector, so I think he probably thought quite a lot about money and the use of money. And when he came to follow Jesus, he invited all of his tax collector friends around and um, they ate together. This is the story of the talents, and often we think about talents and we refer to gifts or abilities, but literally what it means in the original is an amount of money, a, a fairly large amounts of money when you're talking about five talents or ten talents. There's a large amount of money, and in this parable, the master is commending the servant who has been entrusted with talents and and has used them, has invested them, and used them well. So he said, you entrusted me with five talents. See, I have gained five more. 
His master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Not only is there a a direct correlation between how we use money and, and material wealth with how we will be entrusted with true riches or be entrusted with more, it also affects our relationship with God because the master represents the father and because he has invested and stewarded his money, well, the master's money, he says, come and enjoy fellowship. Come and enjoy the master's joy and happiness because you have used this well. Let me tell you a a, a little bit more of a, a small kind of story about God's generosity and his kindness. Uh, Susie and I, my wife and I, tried to train our children from when they were very young about how to use money and basically saying there's three things you can do with money. You can spend it and if you don't spend it, you can save it and thirdly, you can give it away or invest it in some way. And as we were talking with our kids about that, The day came when a young missionary friend was going to go on a missions trip, and we, Susie and I, thought, we really want to help them. We know they don't have all the funds to go. Uh, We'd like to give something. So we wrote out a check, and we were ready to go take it over to them. But we thought, well, let's tell the boys, who were about three and five at the time, what we're going to do, and see if they would like to give anything. So... The boys prayed, and they decided that uh, what they felt God had said to them was that they were to give all of their money away. Um, Their savings at the time was less than five pounds, so it was about three pounds something. But they were saving it up for something very important. They were saving it for Playmobil. Now, Playmobil, if you don't know, are these little plastic figurines and, you know, with maybe five or six pounds, you can buy one little character, one little thing. So that's what they were saving. They had, didn't have Playmobil, but they had seen it at their friends, and that's what they wanted to get next. So they decided they'd give it all away, but as we were walking over with our, with our check and with, with their coins in hand, my oldest son started suddenly crying. And he said, Daddy! I can't live without Playmobil. (laughs) Well, I didn't laugh, and I wasn't sure what to do. So I got down to his level, and I said, Son, God loves us to be a cheerful giver, but it's up to you whether you decide you want to give away this money or not. You felt like God asked you to give it all away, but it's still up to you. But if you do, I want you to give it joyfully. So he kind of dried his tears. But, All right, but, yeah, uh, yeah, but I'm just, I'm just sorry I won't have the Playmobil. So we went and gave the gift. Uh, the next day, we didn't tell anybody about this. The next day, a neighbor came to the door, and the neighbor said, we've just been clearing out our house. We have some stuff we want to get rid of. Said, I've got a big pirate Playmobil ship full of figures. Do you think your boys would like that? My eyes got big. And you can imagine how big my boys' eyes got when the neighbor brought that over. And that's something about the goodness, the generosity of God. If we think it's my money, if we think it's my business, if we think it's my job, if we think it's my kids, my family, mine, we'll never realize the joy of experiencing the intimacy and fellowship and generosity that our Father God wants to give us. Another time, um, the boys were wanting to learn how to play Monopoly, and we'd already taught them about tithing, but they were young, and so they asked me while we're playing the game of Monopoly, which of course, as you all know, is about global domination of you know, get all the money, get all the property. 
So they turned to me and they asked me, Daddy, where's the, where does the tithe go in Monopoly? <laughs> I was like, um, yeah, it goes in the middle. Okay, so they started tithing their money while they were playing Monopoly. As they got better at Monopoly, one time Daddy started losing badly. So they said, um, I think we need to help Daddy out, don't you? Yes, I think we need to help Daddy. He's getting very poor. Let's give Daddy the tithe. So I gratefully received the tithe, which, you know, caused my chances in the game to suddenly increase. But the day came when they were going to play Monopoly with some other friends. <laughs> and suddenly I had to say, uh, these are house rules. Nobody else ties in Monopoly. Jesus, in Matthew 6, 24, again, says, no man can serve two masters. Our possessions often compete with the Lord for the mastery of our lives. Money is not to be master over us. And, and the Bible says that the love of money is the root of all evil. The, the love of money. Not money. Money is used by God. Money can be used to bring about eternal purposes which are good. Money's something that God wants us to use well. But we need to be the master of money under the mastership of the Lord Jesus rather than allowing money to master us. In the Middle Ages, um, of course, baptism was being enforced, and in order to be a soldier, you had to be baptized. But the soldiers, when they would get baptized, they would keep something out of the water. Can you guess what? When they're baptized? Their sword, their hand and their sword. Because that was not coming under the Lordship of Christ. Martin Luther said, in the life of a Christian, three conversions are required. The first is the conversion of the heart. The second is the conversion of the mind. And the third, which is somewhat more difficult, is the conversion of the purse. <laughs> and so, in order to follow the Lord in these areas, we need to begin to learn how to let go of the stronghold of money in our life. One of the things is simply to be honest, to be faithful about money and to be honest about it. One time, over a period of weeks as I was beginning my discipleship training, I kept being given too much change when I'd pay for something in a shop. And I'd look, and it was a pound extra, it was something extra. And I'd be ready to, wow, it's my lucky day, walk out the shop. And suddenly, there would be this conviction that would come, John, that's not right, that's stealing. I'd be like, oh, come on, it's just a pound, you know, big deal. So I'd go back into the shop, go back up to the teller, taking all this time, finally saying, I'm sorry, you gave me too much change. And they would always say, no, I didn't. And I would say, yes, you did. Look, here it still is in my hand. I paid this much. I paid this much. Here's the pound. It's too much. That happened three or four times to me. It's like, I just thought English shopkeepers couldn't count or something. Thankfully, it hasn't happened that frequently since then. But I didn't think two things about it. And then the leader of my discipleship training school, my DTS, came to me and he said, John, we've been praying about who should be the bookkeeper, who should be the accountant for the outreach. And there were about 60 of us going on outreach. It was going to be in three or four different currencies. At the time, Europe didn't have the euro. Um, and so he said, we really feel you should do it. And I said, why? I'm not a bookkeeper. I'm not, you know, don't have a background in finances. No, we prayed. We feel you should do it. And suddenly, there I was, as I told you, I had given away all my money, so I had no money left, except I got one anonymous gift during that period of time, which was 10 pounds. And I was struggling with what do you do when you have no money and people invite you out, want you to go out for a coffee, want you to go out and do something, but you have no money. And yet here I am looking after thousands of pounds, trying to keep track of it. When I came back to do the accounts, 
I was trying to figure out everything, make sure they all balanced, and I was 20p out. And I kept going through, going through. I was quite slow at doing the adding machine and couldn't find the 20p. My school leader came, he was Swiss, and he said, let me have a look. Grabbed the adding machine, he looked at the figures and he started going like this. I had never seen fingers fly that fast on the adding machine. I said, how do you do that? And why are you having me keep the books? We said, we prayed, we felt you were supposed to do it. I said, well, how did you learn to do that? He said, I was a Swiss banker. <laughs> There's the 20p. <laughs> he found it in, in less than five minutes. He found the mistake I'd made. God teaches us, as we're faithful in little things, to entrust more to us. Some years later, a man came to me and he said, uh, would you come and we're building a school for the Maasai, it's a secondary school, we're going to build it all, we'll fund it all, but would you come and bring people from your organization to run the school, to set it up and to run it? And I said, well, do you realize we're missionaries? Because the man who approached us was a Muslim. He ran the affairs for the royal families from the United Arab Emirates. He ran their affairs in East Africa. And he kind of smiled. He said, I'm a liberal Muslim. I think it would be good if Christians and Muslims worked together. And the Maasai need Christians, so will you come and do the school? So I went out to go investigate and was given a nice time in their hunting area where they had the hunting rights. And I was kind of impressed because there in the middle of nowhere was a big house and they flew me in business class courtesy of the government. And they also flew me in on the big C-130 military airplanes into this remote area. And there was a beautiful house in the middle of nowhere. And telling me stories about this and that. So I came back home, and I told my wife a story or two, and of course, a few of my mates, you know, needed to hear a story about the $100,000 sound system in a car. And one night, lying in bed, my wife said to me, John, I'm really sick of what I hear you talking like. I said, what do you mean? He said, you're really impressed by this man and his money. Oh, no, I'm not. You know I'm not. And I was like, but it's not like every day this happens in your life. So, you know, no, she said, you're impressed by it. Sometimes when you have spouses, you don't need the Holy Spirit. But <laughs> anyways, I was a little defensive. I was like, Maybe you're right. But, you know, it was a little tense in bed. So the next day I was in a leadership team meeting and we were praying and considering what we were doing. And I quite heard clearly quite in my mind, John, I don't want you to be wowed by anything but me. And that, that word from the Lord has stuck with me. God is not wowed by wealth or wealthy men. He owns it all anyways. He's not wowed by intelligent people. He knows it all anyway. He's not wowed by people who have lots of power or people who have lots of fame. He's not even wowed, believe it or not, by people who can do lots of miracles and, and amazing kinds of things. He's not impressed by that. And I didn't want to be impressed by those things either. And so I repented. And repent is basically metanoia, to change your mind, to turn around and he head the other direction. And I realized I had been wowed by this experience. We did go out later with a team. We took a team. We did an awful lot of praying to get this school started. Um, there were lots of international politics. There were lots of hiccups. I did have great opportunities with a number of my Muslim friends and a number of the Maasai. And some of them actually then did a discipleship training school. One guy was three weeks into his DTS. You're supposed to be a Christian to do a DTS, but he held his hand up three weeks in and said, you know, the way you're talking about Jesus, I don't know Jesus. I'm not a Christian, but I want to be. 
Later, that same young man became a teacher in the school. In fact, he held conferences that many of the young people gave their lives to the Lord and were discipled as a result of that. I had felt that the year was a failure because in the end, the school was taken away by the government. The Maasai were quite upset about it. I felt it was a total failure. But yet, when we're faithful, God is faithful to us and to produce the fruit which is of eternal value. At the time, I didn't know that these Maasai were going to really give their lives to the Lord. I didn't know what was going to happen. And yet, God notices. My Muslim friend called me years later from the United Arab Emirates, and he said, John, guess where I am? I said, I have no idea where you are. He just called like that out of the blue. He said, John, I have been to see The Passion of the Christ, the movie. I've just been to see it two times. John, you should be here. The movie theater is full of Muslims. I said, oh, really? Really, Ahmed? So what's it like? He said, it is so quiet, you could hear a pin drop. He said, Muslims are weeping and crying as they're watching this. And as they come out, uh, John, John, Jesus was really young when he died on the cross. Well, we had many arguments about whether Jesus actually died or somebody had replaced him or whatever. And I tell you that story because the eternal riches are worth far more than the money in our bank account or the possessions that we have in our house. Who owns it all anyway? The earth is the Lord's and everything in it the world and all who live in it. It's all his, Psalm 24, 1. He owns it all, it says the gold and the silver is mine, the cattle on a thousand hills are mine, the land is mine, everything is the Lord's. He is the master, he is the owner. We are stewards. The world says, I've earned what I have, and I own it. <laughs> it's mine. The Bible says God owns it, all that I possess, and he's in control of my destiny. I am just a trustee. I am a steward. But it is important in a steward to be found faithful. When John Wesley learned that his home had burnt down, he exclaimed, the Lord's house has burnt. One less responsibility for me. How many of us could say that? How many of us would say, when our car has been pranged, <laughs> the Lord's car has been damaged? Or do we just get angry and frustrated? I had one friend, a, a YWAM friend, she used to be a dentist, uh, very trustworthy. She was, you know, already past middle age. She had her car banged one day, a big dent in it. So she took it, she had been just parked in a place, and she took it in then to the repair shop, and the guy looked at it, and he said, yeah, bring it in, um, gave her the date, and you know, it'll cost about this much money to get repaired. So she drove away, and then she prayed, Lord, was this really on your agenda for today? She said, I was going to visit someone in hospice. I was getting flowers. I went in to get the flowers. I came back, and I couldn't find my car. And I looked at this, and thought, this is my car, but there's no, no big dent in the boot. So she said, I drove back to the place where I just asked for the repair quote to be done. And she said, uh, tell me, does this kind of thing happen? And the guy said, that's not your car. Yeah, yeah it is my car. He couldn't believe it. He said, oh my God, I got to start going back to the synagogue. <laughs> <laughs> so why these, you know, different stories of God's miraculous, God's provision, um, why do we 
use our money well? Is it so that we get miracles? No. It's so that the true riches that God wants to entrust us with, He's able to because we've been faithful with the little things, with the, with the worldly things. If we don't trust God, we're like the one who buries their talents. And my youngest brother did bury, literally, one time. He was given $50, and he was given a silver dollar. And um, his aunt, who gave it to him, said, now make sure nobody gets this from you. So he decided, uh, I'll put this in a metal coffee tin. He got out one of these post hole diggers, which you can dig, you know, deep holes. He measured the distance from the doghouse. He dug it down quite deep. He put the can in. He covered it all up, smoothed it out so it couldn't be found, and uh, left it. Quite a while later, he uh, suddenly realized the doghouse had been moved for a while and wasn't sure where this hole was. So he got his post hole digger out and started digging. Couldn't find it. Decided to call a friend who had a metal detector, went over the back garden until he heard the noise, and uh, dug it up, found it, opened up his tin coffee can. The notes had crumbled. <laughs> the silver coin was black. And he learned his lesson. Invest in the kingdom of God. Don't bury your treasure. So uh, thank you very much for listening. I, let's stand and just pray, and then we'll go to our small groups. Father, we know that you own it all. All of the riches of heaven and earth belong to you. And you own us because you created us. We're your people. And so often, Lord, we think we own it. We say it's mine. When in reality, Jesus, there's not one square inch of this earth that you don't declare, this is mine. Not one square inch of this universe that you don't declare, it is mine. Lord, forgive us for our selfishness, for our greed, for our lack of understanding of your ways in the area of finances. Help us to step out in faith and invest in your kingdom in things which will be of lasting, eternal value, and help us to use our money well, neither to be misers nor to waste our money, but to be good, faithful stewards, so that you can say, well done, enter in to your master's happiness and that we might have close, intimate, joyful fellowship with you and so that you could entrust us with what are true riches. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.